that the sun shines down its power to all the world and makes the wind blow strong as it will. I want to hope gentle rains can fall upon the land so lovely earth can stay lovely still. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Energy Week number 453. And you know what, Tom? I have a feeling that I introduced last week's as 453. I don't know why. <laughs> I just have that feeling. But this is 453. This is 453. That's right. Um, and we're, we have, uh, we're doing the show on the 13th of January. So uh, we're going to start on the 6th of January. All of this, of course, is taken from my blog, Energy Week. Um, I'm sorry. So we're doing this on the 13th, but we're starting as of the 6th. That's correct. Correct. Okay. And I get the, the postings are at my blog, which is not Energy Week. It's geoharvey.com. And um, you can go there and, and click on the calendar to find the right posting, or you can go to... Um, one of the, the, we can go to a link which is l lower down on the page that you're on if you're watching this thing over a computer. Or you can go to um, a, a file that can be downloaded. And so there you have it. Well, some of these are well worth looking at. I'll yeah. try to call them to your attention. Some of them are almost mandatory. Yeah, I would say so. Because there's a lot of good stuff on these links. Yep. And one thing that I want to remind everybody of is... We have to come up with a certain amount of money every year. Seven or eight billion dollars, isn't it the last time I checked? I, I think it's less than that. A little bit less than that. <laughs> yeah. Actually, the, the amount is under $300 this uh -huh. year because we have leftover money from last year. But we are asking for people to uh, donate. Um, whatever. Have, haven't we had a donation or two already? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. And um, the way that you do that is go to brattleboro.tv.org and then down at the bottom of the screen is a thing that says support local programming and you click on that and then you give a donation which you can do by credit card or PayPal. I think they prefer um, PayPal. But in any event, when you donate, leave a note. That it goes to us. That it is to support Energy Week. Yeah. So are we all set to start? Well, I think so here. Okay. Let me go to the first picture. There it is. You can put first that picture. up. Yeah, might just as well. Yeah, might as well. <laughs> Why do that? First there we find go. the mouse, Tom. There, there you go. go. <laughs> there we go, boy. That, golly. that ship, there's two ships there, and one of them looks like it might be a freighter. I'm going to guess. It's got, it, it, oh, it could be a tanker, except it's got, it's got uh, cranes on board. So it's probably some kind of a freighter. Some right? kind of a freighter. That's but the one in the background. But this area is clearly a tanker with yeah. the domes on it. Yeah, the domes on it make it clear that this is a, this is a tanker for carrying ga uh, gas or liquefied gas. And in this case, it's liquefied natural gas. And we have an article here uh, that this is with from CNN. CNN usually has some pretty good articles. You know? you, you, very often, yeah. The U.S. becomes the world's top exporter of liquefied natural gas. Now, who'd have thunk? Who'd have thunk? <laughs> well, the U.S. is now the world's leading exporter of liquefied natural gas as the European energy crisis and shortages in China send demand for American shipments soaring. In December, liquefied natural gas exports from the United States topped 7 million metric tons, which is 7.7 .7 million regular old tons. What do they call a regular old ton, officially? Short ton. Yeah, short, short tons ton. and long tons, yeah. Yeah, edging out Qatar and, and Australia. Well, current prices in Europe far exceed those in the United States. Yes. And supplies from Russia are uncertain. Yeah, thank so you So the rival much. of Qatar is boosting its liquid natural gas capacity in response. Right. Rival here, in this case, rival to us. Yep. Cutter, by the way, is spelled Q-A-T-A-R. Q-A-T-A-R, yeah. Yeah. I just wanted to mention that because <laughs> a lot of people call it Qatar. And if you say Cutter, they don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> Which both of us have done, but 
you know, I just wanted to make sure that people understood. Well, I lived over by that way. You I lived never, over never did quite make it to Cutter, but they had things in Cutter they didn't have in Saudi Arabia, like bars. <laughs> <laughs> Not many bars in Saudi Arabia. Um, okay, should we go on? I think so. We got another picture. We have a picture here. here. This picture. reminds me so much of places I lived in Illinois. Um, Illinois. Illinois. I have no idea if that's the way it was pronounced. <laughs> you know, we were told that it was. Well, we got a picture like here of some wind turbines in a wheat field. Yeah, they have How wheat in that? Illinois, but I don't think that's where this was taken. This is from Clean Technica. Fossil gas no longer needed as a bridge to clean energy future. Very important. This is significant. As of late 2021, utilities and investors are anticipating investing more than $50 billion in new gas power plants over the next decade. But we no longer need gas plants to tide us over until renewables are ready for, uh, or affordable. Renewables are here, and they're often cheaper often than gas. Cheaper. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, 70 gigawatt, gig, gigawatt, 70 gigawatts of gas plants could be economically avoided. Yeah, I like okay. the word gigawatt. That's <laughs> <laughs> Combinations of renewable energy, efficiency, demand response, and battery storage are cleaner and more economical yeah. compared to new gas plants. Yeah. And that's why we're not seeing new gas plants opening up. Not a huge number of them. $50 billion over a decade is $5 billion a year. And I got news for you. That's not a huge amount. Well, there's a graph in the, t in the uh, article, and one of the things it says is more than half of the gas plants proposed to come online in the past two years have been canceled before construction began. They're not economically viable they're anymore. Not, yeah, they're not. So not there's a, a big graph idea. about that. Yeah. So this is a takeaway. The myth that gas is needed as a bridge fuel to clean energy future is just that, a myth. A myth, yeah. Okay, should we go on? Well, if I can find a way to, start, to cycle this, and I can, we got a picture of lightning. Here. We have a picture of lightning, that's Who'd right. Who'd thunk? Who'd have thunk? And this is from, we have some impressive pictures of weather. That's a nice weather. picture, it really is. Yeah. Did, did I tell you that I got struck by lightning? I don't know, I don't When think I was a did. kid, I was I walking up did. my basement stairs. Yeah. And the house got struck by lightning, and it wound up going from... Uh, uh, water pipes on one side of me, through my legs, and then I hate it when that happens. into <laughs> a lolly column. And, you know, my, I got up into the in, in living room. I was as white as a sheet. And my I brother bet. said, yeah, my brother said, you should have seen what I just saw. <laughs> <laughs> well, the closest I came was lightning struck a building about 10 feet away from me. That'll, that'll... It scared the hell out of me, and it left a scar on the building, so I know... I, I, I saw a woman walking into her, into her house. I was her, uh, her, her son was my best friend at the time, and she got in the door, and then bam, and the lightning uh -huh. was about eight feet from her, wow. and it left a patch about this big around of just black grass. How about that? How about that? It wasn't that? very different. It wasn't much different yeah. from what I saw. Yeah, yeah. Lightning can be scary. Well, another th sign, things are getting weird. Lightning around the North Pole has increased dramatically in 2021. Lightning around Lightning the North Pole. Lightning never happens at the North Pole. Yeah, this is from CNN. A network of sensors detected, because you, you put sensors up because there's nobody there, detected stunning weather change for the, in the far North Arctic. Lightning increased significantly in the regions around the North Pole, Scientists say this is a clear sign of how the climate crisis is altering the um, global weather. Where is your cursor? This is not scrolling. Take it all the way over that way and try, try scrolling now. No? Won't work? Um, now, you can, now it's scrolling slowly. Slowly. <laughs> wow. Oh, oh there you go. Scrolling. Boy, that thing is really giving you problems. Isn't it? <laughs> okay. We are up to Friday, just January 7th, and while you're playing with that, I'll just keep talking. How about that? Well, we've still got a couple of notes about this oh, past okay. one. Go ahead. The Arctic is changing faster than the rest of the Earth with respect to its climate. Yes. Arctic lightning is rare. Yeah, not Last anymore. Last year, nearly <laughs> twice as many lightning strokes occurred north of 80 degrees latitude as the previous nine years combined. Wow. Things are changing. 
I guess. As the climate crisis advances and the Arctic continues to warm, changes in far remote regions will have a ripple effect on weather across the planet. We've discussed that already. Yes, we have. Lightning triggered wildfires burned more than 2 million acres in the U.S. last year. Wow. Now that's bigger than Brattleboro. 2 million? <laughs> I, th I think you're right. <laughs> Well, we're up to Friday, January 7th. We are already. indeed. I had already said that, but you have you have told everybody, and we have a we have a Volkswagen ID Let's see if I Buzz. Let's that picture up here. Although Buzz should be in, it wouldn't be Buzz in German. It wouldn't be Buzz in German. No, huh? because a because a Z is pronounced like T S. So it'd be butts. Butts. <laughs> the Volkswagen ID butts concept electric <laughs> van. Now, they've been teasing us with this picture for at least five years. I know, it's awful, isn't it? <laughs> and now they're, now they're actually saying it's going to happen. It's going to happen, yeah. It reminds me of fusion energy. When I was a little kid, you know, fusion, fusion energy was 30 years away. Now, 70 years later, it's, it's 10 30. years away. <laughs> So I figure it it gets into it gets closer at a rate of about three years every ten years. Well, a long time ago, I was living in uh, Princeton, New Jersey. Yeah, and nice I, area. Huh? Yeah, nice area. And I was talking to a guy who worked on nu on nuclear, something like that. Yeah. And I remember saying to him, you know, what we really need is a uh, a, a prolonged uh, what is. I forget the word I'm looking for. What we need is, is a program to develop this. Yes. And his response was, it wouldn't matter because there are certain steps that had to be taken, one before the other, and you can't speed you can't them up. You can't do them all at once. You can't speed them up. Yeah, and the other thing that people should know about, about uh, um, fusion energy is that it, you can't do it with water. A lot of people think you can do it with water. You cannot you can do, it do it with, it with water. heavy water. You can do it with heavy water and tritium. Yeah. Heavy water is hard and expensive to get out of the natural environment. Tritium is impossible. <laughs> tritium just you, it doesn't exist in nature for practical purposes. You have to make it in a nuclear power plant. Okay, well, we according are. According to the article here, the original Volkswagen Hippie bus. Yes. Is one of the most iconic vehicles ever. Yes. And that's true. It is a key symbol for a huge era in human history. And there's a lot of pictures about it in the article Yep, here. and I haven't read the synopsis yet. <laughs> <laughs> well, why don't you read Without it? a doubt, an electric version of the iconic VW Hippie bus was bound to attract uh, interest, as it did as Volkswagen dragged it out over and over again. That is to say, they, they pulled this bus out, stuck it on the beach there, over and over again. It appears that Volkswagen will actually launch the ID buzz on March 9th. You want to hold your breath till then? Neither do I. So it uh, implies a tweet from Herbert Dies, the CEO of Volkswagen Group. Well, I had several hippie vans. Did you? And one of them, one of them was a camper, a pop-top camper. Okay. And I loved that thing, you know. Yeah. If I wasn't pl hadn't had any plans for the weekend, I just hop in that bus and go. Yeah. No idea where I was heading or how I was getting there. Yeah. I'd, I'd make up my mind which way to turn at an intersection when I got to that <laughs> intersection. And it that was fun. Like, just, it sounds like a lot of what a lot of kids did in those days. Well, you could sleep in it any time. You know, yeah. had a full-size yeah. bed in the back. I remember when I got into in a car in New Jersey and I just drove to Portland, Maine. One thing I did learn, though, is at night you don't park in a grocery store parking lot because the cops will roust you. <laughs> okay. Yeah, okay, we should go on. Um, our next item. We've got a picture of Western Spirit Wind Farm. Yeah, we do try indeed. To get it up there. And this is from Renews. Pattern is the name of a company. Unleashes a one gigawatt onshore. Oh, and Lucia, not, it's not a one gigawatt, it's unleashing one gigawatt in New Mexico. Yep. Pattern Energy has completed construction and begun commercial operations of its 1,050 megawatt Western Spirit wind complex in New Mexico. Yeah, that's a gigawatt. A gigawatt is a bigawatt. That's right. Western Spirit is comprised of four wind farms, 
uh, which together have a total of 377 GE turbines installed, ranging from 2.3 megawatts to 2.8 megawatts. Something is wrong with that. those numbers. Well, I think what happens is all of them but one or two are 2.8 megawatts. They're small. Yeah, they're, well, they're not big. They're small. Uh, they're, yeah, because they're gigantic. A Heliod X yeah. is 14, 14 megawatts. It can be, yeah. Um, Ten years ago, a two gigawatt, a two megawatt wind turbine was was big, but the, they're, yeah. they're just kind of average yeah. size now. They're making some big ones. Well, according to the article, electricity generated by Western Spirit Wind will be delivered to California and New Mexico. Right, and what they're going to do is, they've got they've got a, a cable that runs through Arizona, but the people in Arizona aren't aren't allowed to have any. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, should we go on? Yeah, I think we should. We got a picture here of a couple of cars. <clears throat> and I don't know if it's optical illusion or not because the cars look very much alike except they're different in size. I think that's an optical illusion. It could very well, well be. Uh, no. I, I according think, to the article, according to the, the picture, same. they're both Chevy Equinox EVs. Yeah, so yeah, okay. It could just be a funky picture. It's from Clean Technica in any event. Well, Chevrolet previews electric Equinox and Blazer at the CES 2022. Maybe one of those is a Blazer. I don't know what a Blazer is. Well, I got a, I got the answer to that. Oh, okay. At Chevrolet, C well, I'll let you finish and okay. then I'll say what it at is. At CES 2022, General Motors CEO Mary Barra announced the coming of two Chevrolet EVs, in addition to the Chevro Chevrolet Silverado EV, which took a lot of attention, they were the Equinox EV and a Blazer EV. The Blazer will be produced first with the Equ Equ Equinox arriving later this year. Well, a Blazer is a mid-sized sporty SUV. Okay. Okay. Equinox is a small SUV crossover. Now look at that. And Silverado is a pickup truck. Yeah. The, that could be the the uh, uh, it could be a larger version. on the left side yeah. and the smaller. Could be a Blazer and a uh, yes, that's right. Okay, Equinox. It could be. <laughs> okay, all done there. I think so. Prices for the Equinox EV started around thirty grand, which is not bad for an EV. For brand new EV, that's that's right in the middle. That's yeah. Right, that's, that's, yeah. That's not exorbitant. Okay, we have an article here from Clean Technica, here. and we have a map. We've got a map of uh, basically New York Harbor. The It's called Much bigger New York Bite. The New York Bite, absolutely. Bite. You've got to emphasize bite. Um. <laughs> B-I-G-H-T, not B-I-T-E. Or B-Y-T-E. Yeah. Uh, or B-Y-T-E, absolutely. That's right. Well... I'll let, I'll let you look at that picture for a while while I catch up to it. I think that's a good idea. These are offshore wind sites for New York yes. in that picture. Yeah. And the article says, and I quote, offshore wind catches fire in the Empire State while others fiddle. I think that's a silly... <laughs> <laughs> fiddle while you burn. It yeah, is. right. It is kind Okay. Of in the race for offshore wind energy, New York is not messing around. The Empire State launched a new $500 million investment program aimed at taking the title of Offshore Queen as uh, announced by Governor Kathy Hochul during her State of the State address this week. Well, I'm going to put the picture Kathy back. Hochul looks to me like she's ready to take over. You know? She has taken over. Well, I'm saying she was ready <laughs> to take over. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I'll leave the, the map up there. And, yeah, good uh, idea. This is, this is from the article. New York claims five offshore projects and five ports under development. Yeah. So they're digging in with, they're jumping in with both feet. Yes, they are. And has procured a total of 4,300 megawatts worth of offshore wind energy towards a goal of 9,000. Yeah. So they're looking to get in deep. Yeah. Representing the largest suite of offshore wind projects under active development in the nation. The $500 million is just for starters. Yeah. So they're, 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 they're going to jump in. They're jumping in. That's right. So we're all set with that? We'll leave you up there. We'll move to the next Me? article. Um, our next article is from Clean Technica. This is an interesting graph. It's confusing. <laughs> well, you've got two lines in the middle of it that look like they're just vertical lines. They aren't. 
they meet about 14 feet up, you know. And, <laughs> Might as well be vertical. <laughs> pretty Mon close. These are monthly, as they say, monthly average wholesale electricity prices at selected trading hubs. So what you're saying is they're off that graph. They're way, way off, off that In that graph. month, the ERCOT is way off the graph. And if you want to think about it. This, these month, are electricity prices. Yeah, well, electricity this is prices. a wholesale price. A wholesale price of one thousand four hundred and eighty-five dollars per megawatt hour is a is is a wholesale price of one dollar and forty-eight point five cents for the for the uh, at a wholesale price for the electricity. Unless you can mark that up as a utility, you're going to lose money, and you're going to lose a lot. Looks that way. And they had people in in Texas who had a special deal where they could they could. They could um, buy electricity at a at a rate that was a markup from the spot rate at the time, and they just went broke on this. People were hit by twenty eight thousand dollar one month power fee, uh, char charges. Well, from the article, it says that, and I quote: "U.S. wholesale electricity prices are higher in twenty twenty one from higher natural gas prices." Why is it higher? Because natural gas is higher. Average wholesale prices for electricity at major trading hubs in the United States were higher in 2021 than in 2020 as higher costs for fuels, especially national, natural gas, pushed electricity prices higher in the second half of 2021. Cold weather also raised costs in February, and that's what those vertical lines are. That's what those lines were. Well, I remember mm. when it happened, cold weather. Cold in weather. February, yep. caused natural gas spikes throughout the United States. Yep, Too and they blamed it all on on renewable energy. It had nothing to do with it. It had nothing to do with the fact that their valves were freezing. That's and what their was pipes happening. were icing over. And, you know. well, oh, well, cold weather in February caused natural pr gas spikes throughout the United States. Yep, a major winter storm led to significant disruptions in Texas. Yes. Which we've talked about. Oh, yes. That was times. what they blamed on that, on, on uh, renewables, and it wasn't happening at all. It had nothing to do with renewables. Extreme cold temperatures restricted the flow of natural gas for power generation, and many wind turbines froze. Yeah. The ones, wind turbines are supposed to be built with, um, with uh, uh, protections against freezing, particularly and in ice Texas, on the they blades, and they didn't do it because it was cheaper not to, and the result of that was those wind turbines couldn't be used because they, they were iced up. Okay. Well, we got a picture here. We have a picture here, which of a is solar system. really dull-looking solar system, nothing <laughs> interesting there, and this comes from Renewable Energy Magazine, and I'm sure that somebody from Electrify is going to get on me and say, that is a great system. Yeah, you're right. It's a great system. Well, companies partner to bring energy access to 20,000 people in rural South Africa. Which is why I don't have to worry about these people calling because they're, <laughs> you know, 12,000 miles away. There are companies joined for financial closure on Africa's second largest project financed mini grid. The investment will fund 11 mini grids in Lesotho. Do you know where Lesotho is? It's a landlocked nation that's surrounded by South Africa. Yeah, it's about the size of a county. And it's, you know. Yeah, it's, sur it's totally I, surrounded by South Africa, but it's not South Africa. Yeah, and I think. They call it a Sutu, by the way. Oh, okay. I, I think that's a kingdom. It might very well yeah. be. With a total of 1.8 megawatts and provide first time electricity access to 20,000 people. So these, well, it's got one of the lowest electrification rates on the continent. Which is saying something. Saying something. The rural electrification rate is estimated below 20%. So 80% yeah. of the population has no electricity at all. My brother went to Burundi, by the way, which has a population of 12 million, 12 and a half million. That's not a big country. No, either. it's not. It's just south of, of um, um, oh, what is the name of that company? Uh, begins with a U. But he had he had interesting experiences there. He went uh -huh. to he went to give a lecture on um, a a, a uh, filter that he invented that will filter out bacteria and stuff from water. Pretty cool. Yeah. Anyway. Well, Lesotho, as I said, is a landlocked nation surrounded by South Africa. Yeah. Now this mini grid that they're talking about will create approximately seventy three hundred new connections. 
Mm -hmm. So all of a sudden, these people are going to have electricity. A lot of people are going to have and electricity. It'll generate up to 3,500 megawatt hours per year. Three and a half gigawatt hours. Gigawatts is megawatts. Yes, that's okay? right. Okay. And it will avoid the emission of some 2,800 tons of CO2 annually. So all told, this is a this is a this is good good yeah. good good development. And we are up to Sunday, January 9th, and we have a yeah. picture here of wind turbines in Minnesota. Is that what these things are? Yeah, Let's and as a matter of fact, they're proof there. positive that you can actually run a min wind turbine when it's cold out. <laughs> this is from the Star Tribune. Why Conexus Energy won't raise electric rates for a fifth year. Interesting. At a time when big Minnesota utilities are raising retail electric rates, energy pr uh, provider Conexus Energy told its nearly 140,000 institutional and residential customers that it has frozen rates for the fifth year. A large part of the cost saving is from solar power and batteries. Interesting. <clears throat> Isn't it? Well, the cost saving rate options provide rebates for cutting demand during peak times. Yeah. Automated metering, battery storage, voltage controls. Yep. So they're getting on the bandwagon here. Yep. They say when we generate power from solar, it saves thirty dollars per megawatt hour. That's a lot. It is. That's three cents per kilowatt hour. Well, as compared to the eighty-five dollars per megawatt hour that connects us to company here, pays to its power wholesaler. Yeah. So it's a, this is a win-win situation all around. Except for the power wholesaler. Except for the power. Well, they own the power wholesaler. <laughs> well, good for them. Okay. Kind of crazy, but yeah, they own their own power wholesaler. And uh, I'd like to own a power wholesaler. Yeah, that, that'd be neat. Do you think that it would be nice? Would I do a good job if I if I owned Energy? Maybe. <laughs> well, you wouldn't be here today, probably. Oh, uh, how do you know? <laughs> Maybe this would be the greatest joy of my life. Oh, you'd be out somewhere spending your money. <laughs> um, maybe. Okay, Clean well, Technica. Picture here. Clean Technica gave us this. That's this, a remotely operated vehicle, so they say. Yes, and it's really interesting to see what this vehicle is doing. Well, we'll talk about that in Let's a second. Let's do that, Tom. The metals company, the name of the company, TMC, finishes its deep sea research campaign. The metals company is focusing on sourcing it. Uh, the critical metal, metals and minerals needed for producing batteries for electric vehicles, but they're doing it in a unique way. TMC collects nodules. Now, I got to tell you, a nodule is a thing that looks like a lump of coal. A lump of something. Something, yeah. Could be a lump of coal. Well, uh, we've talked about them on the show. Yeah. And they are very rich in uh, things that we need, like cobalt and nickel. And nickel. Yeah. Uh, they collect them just lying around on the on the surface of the seafloor, like golf balls like on a golf driving balls range. on a driving range. That's what it says, and they can be collected collected directly. So this vehicle that you see here is is set up so that it's got cameras and lights and whatever it needs to go down to the ocean floor and then um, pick up these nodules. They look around and they find these nodules that are lying around, around like golf balls on a driving range. You just pick them up and huh, I got throw a quick, them in, I got in your a basket. quick takeaway here that Go I'm ahead. At. The oceans are filled with metallic, metallic nodules containing critical <laughs> minerals and metals used in EV battery production. Just waiting to be made into EV batteries. So TMC, the company, is designing a collector vehicle to harvest these nodules. Yeah. The nodule project was recently ranked as the number one nickel project in the world. Who knew? Who knew? <laughs> well, we knew because we've actually had we've talked about talked it. about this before. But there are interesting pictures on this, and there's a picture of guys. Well, these nodules have a lot of goodies in them. They and they're do. They're lying there. They're just to yeah. be picked up by something that looks like this. I'll see yeah. If, well, see if I can't get it up. They there have a is. picture of guys operating this from the ship. And yeah, it's remote, right? It's remote uh, operated, but it's really interesting because you can see the nodules sitting on the floor of the of the ocean. Okay, well, now what do we do? We got a picture coming up here, and it is a view of, of the, the cascades. cascades. Well, come on, how actually come you're going that's this not way? the cascades. That's the Cascades Park, but n nevertheless. 
<laughs> well, Sir J. A. from Unsplash claims it's a view in the Cascades. Yes, that's right. So we'll have to go with that. I Well, you know, what can I say? New study shows protecting ecosystems takes priority over planting trees for carbon storage. Yep. This is from Clean Technica, and it makes sense when you think about it. Planting trees is a necessity to help remove carbon from the atmosphere, but it's not enough. Yes, there has been a lot of awareness about planting trees. However, a study has found that protecting ecosystems should be given first priority. So in the first thing you do if you want, if you want to help with, with uh, atmospheric carbon is stop cutting the trees down. Stop burning things. Stop burning <laughs> things. The most critical action needs, that needs to be taken is reducing fossil fuel emissions. Yes. Yet natural climate solutions are required to meet that goal. Yes. These include protecting existing ecosystems, improving the management of working lands, and restoring natural ecosystems. This is an informative article. Mm -hmm. We especially need to protect the ecosystems that we have instead of destroying them. Yes. Bingo. Absolutely. Yeah. Bingo. If you think about it, Tom, if you've got a big tree and you're going to cut it down, yeah. planting another tree isn't really going to help. Not for a long, long Not time. for a long time, because <laughs> that tree has got to grow up. That yeah. big tree, as long as it's alive and healthy, is going to continue it's sucking, sucking CO2, out of CO2 out of the air. Okay, our next picture is of Gautam Adam, Adami. I'll see if I can get a picture Adani. of him up here. And this is from First Post. Where is he? There he is. There you go. Here's Gautam. Yep. And this is from... He's a very wealthy man. Yeah, he's one of the world's wealthiest people. And by the way, you know, if you look at... No, it's not... He's not the one. There's a different man who is also wealthy in India who's got yes, a 40-story like, uh, uh, house. <laughs> What, is he, what do you need a 40-story house for? I don't know. <laughs> you need 38 stories to hold the household staff. Well, we'll look at, Gaut we'll look at Gautam, Gautam Adani again for a yeah, second. Yeah, this is from First Post. Then we'll say the title here. Yeah, good idea. Adani Group. Guess who owns it? <laughs> he does. That's <laughs> Floats Anil, A-N-I-L, for green energy projects, Ho aims to become the world's biggest renewables company. Now, ANIL is just the name of one of his companies. Yeah, and this, I think this guy is fairly smart. Um, Adani Group has set up a subsidiary, Adani New Industries Limited, for low carb carbon electricity and green hydrogen projects and to manufacture wind turbines, solar PVs, and batteries. Its goal is to be the world's largest renewable energy company. They're on, they're on track. I think they are. Well, Adani is investing $70 billion, U.S. dollars, to develop and operate projects for the synthesis of low-carbon fuels and chemicals. Yeah. Generation of low-carbon electricity and the manufacture of key components and materials for projects, including the generation of green hydrogen. So he's jumping in with both legs. He sees... This, this, this is what this guy sees for the future, and he's getting in on it. Anil, the company, will also manufacture solar modules, batteries, electrolyzers, and associated upstream manufacturing. There you go. He's getting right in on the <coughs> ground floor. Yep. He knows what he's doing. I think he does. Okay, so our next item is here. from Clean Technica, and what we have here... These, well, let me get the picture. Okay, up do here. that. What we have here is a bunch of parts. And you know, this is not, this is not, well, it's almost this like. This is toy just parts. ordinary. I, I got stuff like this in my uh, toolbox. The, the thing in the, I'm looking at this. And it, These are just random parts. I mean, there's batteries right in the middle there. Yeah, there's a, Rheostats. The, in the upper right-hand section of that is a green circuit board, which is an UNO, which is not Raspberry Pi. But these are parts that kids might use to, uh, to do... You know, when you and I were kids, we had Erector sets. 
Yeah, oh sure. And now they don't have erector sets. No, they don't. They have these things where they can have robots and... Well, I had these things too. Oh, okay, good for you. <laughs> okay. I had a whole mess of electrical parts. Okay. Batteries in parts, according to the article. Scientists develop stable sodium battery technology. Now, this is significant. It is. If the lithium and cobalt in lithium ion batteries is replaced, it will result in a technology that is more environmentally and socially conscious, scientists say. Toward that end, University of Texas at Austin researchers have developed an improved sodium based battery material. Well, as I've mentioned, when I was in college, we spent 47 minutes in four years talking about batteries. Yeah. <laughs> I'm exaggerating a little bit, but we didn't talk about batteries. Well, you'd probably get a better education going to the local gas station and talking to the <laughs> owner. Well, ions in batteries travel between a negative anode and a positive cathode. Yeah. That's normal. In sodium-based batteries, anodes can develop filaments called dendrites that cause electrical shorts and decrease the chances of a fire or explosion. And we've seen that. We've seen fires coming yep. from. This new sodium-based technology resists dendrite growth and recharges as fast as a lithium-ion battery. That's important. It is. People are starting to play, pay attention to batteries, where, as I oh, said, yeah. in college, we just ignored them. But we talk about them a lot on this show. On this show, we do. Well, times are changing. Yeah. They're much more important now than they were then. I mean, yeah. Back when I was in college, there was basically only two kinds of batteries, those in a car and those in a flashlight. Yeah. <laughs> that was about it. Yeah. Typically, the faster you charge, the more of these dendrites grow, you grow. So if you suppress dendrite growth, you can charge and discharge faster. Now, this is what they're trying to do. Well, they're trying to provide a stable, sustainable, and less expensive solution. Right. How much you want to bet they succeed? Oh, somebody's going to succeed. They, <laughs> I they think succeed so. all the time, I as a think matter so. of fact. Okay, Another we've got a picture here coming up. This is a whoops. very interesting picture here. Yeah, this is a model, and you you can know that by a number of different things. Not well, you're looking at this thing, and it could be a printed circuit board. Okay. And it could also be an airplane's view of a factory. Yes. <laughs> Except that those tall things are all polished like mirrors. <laughs> And you know that in real life that wouldn't happen. That this wouldn't is, happen. This is coming from The Guardian, and I think we've actually had that picture before. We may have. I think we have, because they look, it looks very familiar. Very familiar, yeah. yeah I'll, leave it, I'll leave it up for a little while. Okay. Longer. Here's how to solve the UK energy crisis for the long term. Store more power. And my remark to that is, duh. <laughs> <laughs> the key to making sure there's enough affordable low-carbon energy is to store is more storage to make uh, the most of renewable energy available. A storage boom has been forecast over the coming decade as governments race to meet their climate targets. Well, reliance on renewables such as wind and solar does not solve the problem of intermittency. Not by itself. The key is more storage. Yep. And global energy storage capacity is expected to, to expand by 56% to reach more than 270 gigawatts. That's gigawatts, baby. Yeah. By 2026. That's coming up pretty quick. It's coming up pretty quick, but I think they're wrong. You think so? Huh? I think they're wrong. I think it's going to come a whole lot faster than that. Well, the article talks about four long-range energy storage options which could help keep the lights on in the future. Yep. And these four I'll list them because they're... I'm not going to elaborate on them. Gravity storage, which includes pump storage, okay? Concentrated solar power storage, where they store the heat. Green hydrogen, where they store the green hydrogen, or make ammonia out of it and store the ammonia. Right. And then cryogenic batteries, which rely on liquid air, but they have to be kept very cold. Well, they'll keep themselves cold, they actually. Keep, well, yeah, <laughs> but it, it takes energy to keep them cold. Actually, you know what you can do? is let them leak, because the, the <laughs> hottest part is what's going to leak out. Yeah. So, so anyway. We've got a picture here from the bridge of the NOAA ship, this, Bel Shumada. This, um, this bridge, by the way, is, I think, a 360-degree view bridge. So it's standing up on the superstructure of the ship at the top, or possibly okay, so something it's not, above it. Okay, uh, so 
just a front of the ship. They, they got a they're looking all around. They got a 360 there. degree view, and you can see, interestingly enough, that there are people up there with binoculars looking out to see what's in the distance. Well, I would bet they know what they're doing. I think you they can tell that by the blue you know, uniforms. I I <laughs> had an office mate once in a computer company who yeah. who um, was a had a doctorate in oceanography, and oh. and he worked for NOAA at, at uh, Woods Hole, and he told me about a NOAA ship where an intern had got on the ship uh, to, do a, to do a summer internship, and he was a young guy who was in college, and um, the Coast Guard stopped the NOAA ship and searched it. No kidding. For drugs. No kidding. And they found, they found some. a joint in his uh -oh. luggage, <laughs> and because of that, they confiscated the ship. No kidding. Yeah. Wow. Noah had to go back to the Coast Guard on its hands and knees. What does Noah stand for? Uh, National Oceanographic and, and Aeronautic Administration. Okay. And you know so, it's like so that's the, the federal U.S. Or government. The UN? It's federal. So it was the federal government, one agency of the federal government going after another agency <laughs> of the federal government, confiscating a ship over one joint. And where where did that guy end up on his next job? I don't know. <laughs> I, I, really I would don't. imagine that he didn't last very long after confiscating the ship. No, I don't think so. Yeah. Well, every decade has been warmer than the previous. Yes. This is quite likely to continue. Yes. Um, is that the title of this? No, uh, that's a remark. I got a couple of remarks. Okay. The last seven years have been the warmest on record as the planet approaches a critical threshold. This is from CNN. The last seven years are the seven warmest on record for the planet, data shows. The Earth's average temperature is around 1.1 degrees Celsius above average pre-industrial levels. Copernicus reports 73% of the way, that, that is 73% of the way to the 1.5 degree threshold to avoid the worst impacts of climate change. Well, I think I said this, but I'm going to say it again. Go ahead. Every decade has been warmer than the previous. Right. This is quite likely to continue. I think it probably is. And 2021 made abundantly clear the world is already feeling unprecedented effects of the climate crisis many are not prepared for, yeah. including significant melting of events in the Arctic, mm -hmm. deadly floods, yeah. unprecedented heat waves, and historic droughts. Yeah. All these are happening. Yeah, global greenhouse gas concentrations, the root cause of climate of the climate crisis, continue to surge. My daughter went on a train ride. And this is many years ago. She's still living in England. Uh, Scotland. Scotland. Yeah. yeah. She went on a train ride across the Midwest, and she, and it was ha it happened during a flood. Oh boy! And she said that they were completely surrounded by water on this train. I bet. For something like two hours as they crossed as they the they crossed. The, yeah. the whole ferry was submerged. Except for the train tracks. Yeah, <laughs> how about that? The only way to halt the alarming trend is by making deep cuts to greenhouse gas emissions. Well, I got very bad news for people, and that is if we stopped eliminating cl uh, climate change emissions today, yeah. climate change would, la would continue it would still last for probably, decades, at yeah, least. Yeah, I was going to say for t at least till the middle so, of the century. At least. At, at least. least. Okay. Experts warn that global greenhouse gas emissions in 2030 will still be roughly twice as high as what's necessary to limit global warming. Yeah. Okay, should we go on? Yeah, we should. We got a nice picture, picture of, of a Diablo a Canyon. A nuclear plant. Nuclear. Nuclear. That's what <laughs> Jimmy Carter said. I know, and he's a nuclear engineer. He's a nuclear engineer. <laughs> By the way, go, uh, folks, it is nuclear. Not nuclear. Not nuclear. <laughs> Look at the word to see how to pronounce it. It is N U C L E A R. Nuclear. Okay, this is from PB Carter Magazine. Carter was one. What? And Carter was one. Carter was a was a naval officer. He was also a nuclear engineer. Well, that may be, but he yeah. was a naval yeah. officer first and foremost. Oh yeah. And so we have Pete, and, and a hero as a nation as a nu as a nuclear engineer, as far as I'm concerned. PV Magazine USA. What he do you got? He was responsible for the nuclear submarines, wasn't he? No, that was uh, that was Rickenheim. Rick yeah, that's right. R Rick Carter went to like Canada that. when they had a meltdown. 
and he and his crew they went into the went hole into the, there. Yeah. yeah, we talked about that on a show. We about did two in, weeks a ago. couple of weeks ago. That's right. Well, an RFP alert: 115 gigawatts of renewable of renewables is mandated by the CPUC, and the CPUC is the California Public Utilities Commission. Right. The Diablo Canyon nuclear plant is set to retire in 2025 as California switches to renewable generation. Now, here's the, here's the cool thing. Three community choice, choice aggregate, aggregators jointly issued a request for proposals as part of a state mandate for 11,500 megawatts, and that is 11.5 gigawatts. That's, about, that's a lot of electricity. That's a lot of megawatts. Well, carbon, yeah, car, CCAs, carbon, what do they call them? Carbon, uh, blah, 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 blah. You got it. That's exactly what they call them. Well, they call them CCAs, but CCA stands for. They, oh, they're community choice aggregators. That's, That's what I was looking for. Good they for allow you. townships to get together and choose to get their energy from a selected supplier in one big purchase. Right. Okay, so the We've local utility locally. continues to deliver the energy through its power lines. They're starting to do that in New Hampshire now. They've been doing it in Massachusetts. They're doing it nearby Massachusetts, yeah. exactly. Yeah, and um, let's see, this is carbon emissions, free energy, and long-duration energy storage. And that long-duration storage, by the way, is a key issue because Nuclear power, you know, the sun doesn't always shine, the wind doesn't always blow. I'm really tired of that because it, it simplifies <laughs> it's the It's always thing. blowing somewhere or well, shining somewhere. Well, not only somewhere. that, but if you look at baseload power, what is baseload power? People can't answer that question. We need baseload power so that we know that the bathroom light will turn on at 2 o'clock on Sunday morning, but they don't know what baseload power is. <laughs> and if you look at baseload power, you discover, if you look at it carefully, you cannot, cannot, absolutely impossible, cannot power a grid exclusively with baseload power because it's inflexible. You've got to be able to follow the, 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 the load. Well, if the baseload power consists of nuclear, or, I mean, it takes a long time to, for nuclear to go up and to go down. Yes, the same thing with coal. We're talking about days here, not hours. Exactly, sometimes weeks. The, the same thing is true of coal and natural gas baseload plants. So they, the, the baseload power from nuclear and so forth is just the flip side of a coin. And on the other side, you've got solar, wind, and batteries. And batteries switch the output that they've got far, far, far faster than the, the plants that uh, that Well, you can turn batteries on and off with a switch. Yeah. Bingo. Bingo. You're on. In less than a, one clock cycle, one <laughs> cycle of the 60 cycle uh, alternate current. Okay, we should probably go on. Well, we got another another. We have a picture here picture of here. impressive weather, which I had said we would have before. It's weather on the high plains. That is an impressive sight. <laughs> it is really, kind of scary. Really impressive. The, well, co the light color of that, by the way, comes because the sun, the sun is hitting it. it. Yeah. From the left, yeah, go ahead. Weather disasters have cost the U.S. $750 billion over the past five years. This is from wow. CNN, yes, wow. A historic freeze that hit Texas, a deadly hurricane that wrecked havoc from the, from the uh, Gulf Coast to the Northeast, a record-shattering heat wave and drought in the West were just three of 20 weather disasters that hit the U.S. in 20. 21, each costing over a billion dollars. Each cost over a billion. Yeah, and some of them cost many, many billions times. of dollars. So this is, and this is just going on year after year. Well, last year was the second consecutive year with 20 or more billion dollars disasters. Yeah. And well, in the old days, it used to be one or two. Something that had never occurred before. Yeah. The price tag was $50 billion more, and the extreme weather was far more deadly. Yeah. Over the last five years, the U.S. has experienced almost, you ready for this, $750 billion of damages from these billion-dollar disasters. Climate change is amplifying the extremes that lead to these billion-dollar disasters. Yeah. It's very sad. And the article, by the way, lists the $20 billion disasters of 2021 along with the amounts, and it's scary. Yes. 
Well, we used to have disasters that were extremely deadly in the old days. I'm thinking of like that thing that happened in Galveston, Texas, and yes, over a hundred yep. years ago. And Something happened down around Philadelphia. When? Yeah, there was a disaster back. There, 20, there 20 have been. There's ago. always yeah. been disasters. And, but this was and one some of, the of them were, a lot of people died. Yeah. But the reason that happened was because they didn't have any, any um, rules about building buildings and, and so forth to make sure that, you know, there was safety involved. Okay, Tom, we should probably go on to our next one. Do you have more on that? No, we got another nice picture here. Though. We have a picture of the Dixie Fire in California, and the item is from Clean Technica, and Tom knows all looks about like what it is. Looks like quite a fire. That looks like a big fire. <laughs> yeah. Although I think that's actually rather distant. It's, the truck isn't burning. No, it's not, is it? It's, nope. it's the, the gar garbage in the front. I think that if, the, if, the, if those guys were worried at all about that truck, it would they be wouldn't out of there. They wouldn't be there. Yeah. <clears throat> well, it's, that is a picture of the Dixie Fire in yes. California, as we said. Yep. U.S. saw its fourth hottest year on record in 2021 fueled by a record warm December. In the, year, um, in the U.S. in the year 2021 was marked by extremes including exceptional heat and devastating severe weather. It had the second highest number of climate disasters and billion dollar weather on record. Here is a recap of the year's climate and extreme weather events. So you've the got recap a recap includes a map of the United States which is plotted with significant climate events yeah. that occur throughout the year. Yeah. By the way, I was going to mention that in 2019, somebody went out and did a survey of 11,600 scientists to see how many of them accepted the idea that, that human-caused climate change was happening in a seven-month period. And these were just scientists who Various had... Various kinds of scientists. Yeah, well, they, they had all published in peer-reviewed journals of meteorology and climatology. Okay, so they were knowledgeable. They scientists. were knowledgeable on this particular issue. And they found that 100% of them acknowledged that human-caused human climate change was happening. Duh. <laughs> well, I mean, Barack Obama was called out on the line because he said 97%. Yeah. And when he said that, I said, wait, wh wh why doesn't he come up with a decent figure? It's way over 97%. Anyway, there Well, there's it. a lot of uh, <clears throat> money being spent by the people who own the uh, oil and gas companies. Hiring scientists to write yeah. about why climate change is not happening and, and publish it in, in journals that are not peer-reviewed journals of climatology <laughs> and meteorology, but other kinds of, of peer-reviewed. You know what? You can just start a peer-reviewed journal, Tom. You and I could start a peer-reviewed journal. <laughs> and the journal would be wonderful because it would be the, the, the journal of everything. You'd review mine. I'd review ours. And we're, they're peer-reviewed. It, right? it could be a peer-reviewed <laughs> journal of everything. You could put anything in there saying any, and all we do is just accept or deny. <clears throat> but well, that says peer review. It doesn't say that they, they agreed with it. That's the other thing, too. Yeah. Although they did publish it, and I will tell you that some peer-reviewed journals will publish anything in their venue if they get paid to do it. Well, the article has a recap of the climate and extreme weather events across the United States in 2021. Yeah. And you've probably heard of all of them, but uh, recapping them is kind of scary. It is. Okay, we should go ahead. Yeah, we got another picture here coming up. See if we, we have a chart of... One. <clears throat> retirements, expected plant retirements. Why would they do a thing like that? Well, because they're getting old. Expected plant retirements. And they in, retired in, me. In, those mat, in that map, <laughs> black represents coal. Yep. So 85% of U.S. electric generating capacity re retirements in 2022 will be coal. Yeah. Why? <laughs> Well, it's because the plants aren't worth anything. You it's might the, as well just it's shut the them down. economic <clears throat> stupid. What? It's the economic stupid. I think it probably is. Yes, I think I think you might be right. Eighty-five percent of U.S. generating capacity requirements in 2022 will be coal retirements. I said requirements, retirements. So they're return, they're re retiring coal pretty quickly. Well, n you know what? They're retiring. Uh, 12.6 gigawatts of coal in one year. That's only 
roughly, very roughly, 5% of the coal plants. Okay. So, you know, at that rate, it would take them 20 years to really... Well, from the article, it says, coal plants are retiring as the coal fleet ages and as coal-fired generators face increasing competition from natural gas well, and renewables. It's the renewables. They're replacing... Okay. They're so natural facing. gas... The retiring capacity is made up of older steam turbine units. Yes. Okay. And nuclear, the retiring nuclear capacity comes from only one plant. Yeah. In this article. Yep. The Palisades Nuclear Plant in Michigan. Yeah. Which and the retirement of early. that plant is a result of historically low natural gas prices, limited growth in electricity demand, and increasing competition from renewable energy. Yeah. In other words, they don't need it anymore. In other words, they don't need it anymore. That plant, by the way, is on the east shore of Lake Michigan, and it's roughly northeast of Chicago. Okay. Okay. Here is our last picture of our last news item. It comes from CNN. Oceans were the warmest on record in 2011, 2021, for the third year in a row. And there's a nice picture up there. That picture is the Mediterranean Sea, by the way. Is it? Yep, it is just off the off the coast of Israel. Uh huh. That's what I've read. Anyway, the the um, last year was the hottest year on record for oceans for the third year in a row. An annual study published in the journal Advances in Atmospheric Sciences found the past five years had been the hottest five years on record for the oceans. The records go back to the late 1950s. Well, there's records going back about, about atmospheric heat, and they say the last seven years are the hottest seven years on record for the air. Well, they say that global warming is actually ocean warming. Okay. Okay, and ocean warming has serious consequences. Yes, no more lobsters. It keeps no breaking lobsters. records, which is a reminder that the world needs action yeah. to combat climate That's right. change. That's right. This is part of a long-term upward trend in ocean temperature that science, scientists say is overwhelmingly due to planet warming fossil fuel emissions. Stop burning things, guys. Yeah, and stop it as fast as you possibly can. You know. Well, greenhouse gas emissions from fossil fuels trap heat in the planet's atmosphere, yeah. creating an energy imbalance. The oceans, in turn, absorb 90% of this excess heat. Yeah. Okay, so it's, it's kind of a vicious circle. Well, the, the, the nasty thing about it is the oceans can only absorb so much heat, and the thing that cools them off is the ice that's disappearing in the Arctic and the ice and the is disappearing. So how are, we going to, how are we going to maintain the oceans getting warmer? The oceans are going to get warmer to a point, and then they're going to stop getting warmer. And the fact is that as they get warmer, they, they produce stronger, more and more powerful hurricanes. That's what it says. Uh, warmer oceans supercharge weather patterns to create more powerful storms. And okay. it's not just hurricanes. It's and the oceans will continue warming for decades after fossil fuel emissions are slashed. Exactly. This is a very... So th this is scary. Of, it's a scary proposition. There are things that we can do to reduce the amount of carbon dioxide in the o oceans. And one of the things that came out last week, and unfortunately... And methane, by the way. What? And methane. Well, one thing we can do for the oceans is there are certain kinds of rocks that if you if you break them up and put them in the ocean, they will absorb carbon dioxide from the ocean. That's good. So that can be done. But we're going we're gonna to have to get very, very serious about drawing down carbon dioxide because we're in trouble. So. Well, as it says, the oceans will continue warming for decades after fossil fuel emissions are slashed. Yeah. And the sooner... So we got to stop burning things. The sooner we stop, the better off we are. Yeah. And... Um, you know, there it is. Well, that's the end. That's that the is end the, of the end. show. It Let's see what we have here. for the last slide. It says, have a stupefyingly gorgeous week. Well, let me try and get that, slide, that, that picture up if I can. <laughs> there we go. There you go. Now, you should Stupefyingly put, gorgeous, huh? Stupefyingly gorgeous. So you see it and you say, wow, that's so beautiful. The only thing I can say is, duh. <laughs> <laughs> Why don't you put us up and we'll wave goodbye. Come on back next time. <laughs>